welcome to the Raising Voices film series. Uh, my name is Kim Brown. I'm a host and producer here at The Real News Network. We want to thank all of you for coming out this evening and watching Three and a Half Minutes, Ten Bullets. He's being charged with shooting and killing 17-year-old Jordan Davis. The confrontation began over loud music. Was there music playing in the car? Yes. What type of music? Rap. Did the defendant say anything about the music? Oh, I hate that thug music. Thug is the new N-word. We've just seen four black kids. I'm not racist. They're racist. Michael Dunn is claiming self-defense. Jordan Davis threatened Michael Dunn. He goes, you're dead, bitch. I look, and I'm looking at a barrel. This is about the right of everyone to protect themselves, to protect their family. Under the law, it's justified. I said, you're not going to kill me, you son of a bitch. There's no weapons in the car. It could have been just a stick. It could have been your imagination. It certainly... Well, no. I mean... Anything's possible, I guess. Maybe they didn't have a gun, but he thought they had a gun. They think it's a gun when it's in the hands of a young African-American. Trayvon Martin's father texts me, I just want to welcome you to a club that none of us want to be in. It's going to be open season. Open you can season say later on, that maybe on who? So what did you guys think about the film? It was extremely, extremely powerful, powerful documentary. and. You know, one of the things that really struck me about this film was how raw it was emotionally and how you totally feel 100% empathy um, for Jordan and for his parents. But you also saw the emotion that came from uh, Michael Dunn and his family and his fiance. And it just shows you how these senseless acts of violence, they reverberate, they ripple a, a, across families, across societies, and a lot of people end up uh, tragically getting hurt. But we are really excited and honored um, to have Jordan Davis's father here with us tonight. And we will be taking questions. Um, so if you could be thinking of questions that you have for Mr. Davis, and uh, we will get to those after our conversation. But I believe um, we, we are ready. Uh, I'd like to welcome to Baltimore, here to the real news, Ron Davis. How you doing, Ron? I, I just had the opportunity to watch Three and a Half Minutes, Ten Bullets this week. And I, as I was telling you, Ron, I was reluctant to watch it because these stories, I mean, they, they rip at, at your heartstrings. But when I watched it, I, I watched it again because it was that raw, it was that honest. So um, it was very well done. What, what were your thoughts about the documentary when you first saw it? First of all, thank you for the welcome, Baltimore. Thank you, love Baltimore. Love your crabs, love your blue crabs. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I even came as a, a youngster to do the duck ride here. I think that little crazy oh kind of duck ride you have here. But uh, thank you for uh, accepting and welcoming me. And, and whenever you welcome me, you welcome Jordan Davison, you welcome Lucy McBath, Jordan's mother. Uh, the way the documentary started was Manette Nelson, who's with the Filmmakers Fund out in uh, California, she has five grants to make five documentaries per year. And she sent a note to my, an, uh, my attorney right after, probably about six months after Jordan was killed. And she said, I want to use all these five grants to make this one documentary about your son. She said, your son has touched my children's hearts and it has touched mine and my husband's heart. And we want to get a director Mark Silver, who has just won an award for cinematography at the Sundance Film Festival, and he lives in London, and we're gonna bring him over here to, to do this film. And when she approached him with it, he flew straight over to Jacksonville, Florida, where I live, and once we had a meeting, we knew we had the right team together. And so uh, from that, we got participant media on board. We decided, you know, we're gonna go for it. We're gonna 
make a film that we're going to take to Sundance. And uh, we actually took it to Sundance and won a Sundance Award in Sundance for social impact. And that's what we wanted to do. Uh, the film was raw. I told the, uh, the director one thing that I demand is that no retakes. You know, whatever raw footage that you get, no matter whether you get it now and you miss it or whatever happens, you just keep shooting, keep shooting until you get enough for this film because this is not a stage play. This is not some type of uh, movie with uh, Denzel Washington or somebody. This is raw. This is our family. This is our heart and soul. And you just have to capture the moment as the moment is there. So you have to keep shooting. So we are fortunate to get all these scenes from the courthouse because we got the permission to use our cameras right in the courthouse, which is you hardly would ever get that as long as we didn't film the jury. So we were very fortunate. And me and Jordan's mother actually made this film for the families of lost loved ones out here, like Freddie Gray's family and all these families that you hear, Oscar Grant in Oakland, California, uh, Michael Brown Sr. and all these other families, uh, Emmett Till's family, all the way to Emmett Till. You know, we work with these families. And they hardly ever see justice. And we wanted to show them what justice looks like in a courtroom because you'd never get complete justice, but at least we can get justice for the killing of our children. So that's one of the reasons why we did the film. Now, Ron, you talk about getting justice, and Michael Dunn was sentenced to life in prison, no possibility of parole, plus 90 years. Um, yeah. Obviously, that was the outcome that you were hoping for. But was it the outcome that you were expecting? Were you preparing yourself for an acquittal? And had he been acquitted, how would that have changed how you and Lucy were able to, to carry on after Jordan's passing? Well, the, the first thing that we thought of, the, the same prosecutor that prosecuted uh, in the Trayvon Martin case was the same prosecutor that we had, which was a negative to us. The first thing I thought about the prosecutor, who was Angela Corey, was this. These people, they walk around and they talk to lawyers and judges all day. And their frame of reference is from these conversations with law enforcement and judges, lawyers. And what I had told her before the first trial ended, and, you know, before jury selection, I said that you have to tell the jury what it means to have premeditation. When you have first degree murder, you must prove premeditation. To premeditation to the lay person like me and you, that means the person went to their car to get a gun, or they went to their home, got a gun, and came back, or whatever. That's premeditation to us, that the person went somewhere and got something and came back. You have to let the jury know that under the law, 10 seconds could be premeditation. For the mere fact that Michael Dunn reached over in his glove compartment, unlocked his glove compartment, pulled his gun out, which was holstered, unholstered the gun, slid the slide back, turned around, then shot, that is premeditation. And she said, well, we don't need all of that because, you know, we have so much evidence, we'll convict him. Don't worry, Mr. Davis. I said, okay. I said, but you know what? If you don't get a conviction for the killing of my son, you're going to have problems with me. So get the handcuffs ready. And so all of a sudden she said, well, we got so much, you know, we have everything that we need. We have the boys as witnesses. We have everything that we need. Well, as you saw in the film, came back, they couldn't decide on justice for Jordan. Never mind that they convicted him on attempted murder, but not murder. And as a parent, as a loved one, whether your father, mother, sister, brother, niece, aunt, whatever, you want to make sure that state says that it was not right to kill your loved one. You don't care about all that other stuff. You just want to make sure that you got justice for your child or for your loved one. And so that's why we went back to court. And when I saw Angela Corey after the first verdict, she had tears in her eyes when she looked at me. I said, what did I tell you? And she ran into her office and didn't say anything else to me because we had a knockdown scream out, you know. And so she said, well, we're going back to court. I said, I know you are. I know you're going back to court. So that's when we went back to court. And they focused on premeditation to the jury. They kept putting up signs on their little screen what premeditation means. 
And the second thing that I told her was that also make them understand the difference between reasonable doubt and imaginary doubt. Reasonable is if a hundred people were in that same situation that Michael Dunn, where a kid was hollering through the window, would that person feel it's reasonable to grab a gun and shoot 10 bullets into a car full of kids? Is that reasonable? Because sometimes the jury just hear the word doubt. Doubt. And if it's doubt in my mind, it means I have to acquit if it's doubt. It's not about doubt, it's about reasonable. And so when they kept listening to what reasonable means, they came back. Now, I actually didn't think that I was going to get an acquittal, I mean, a, a, a conviction on the second trial. The reason why, and here where racism come in, here's where, here, here's where bias comes in. Because we live in a country where there's so much bias, the jurors in the Michael Dunn case in the second trial, there were seven white men out of 12 jurors. And my heart dropped when I saw the jurors. See, in this country, one thing that's unfair, the defense attorney has 10 strikes. And if we have any law lawyers in the crowd, they have 10 strikes. And they can use all those strikes to strike, in this case, every black person that came up, they struck every black person down to not to be in that jury. 10 strikes, they used every one, and every strike was a person of color. And that's what's unfair in our jury system that you have those 10 strikes. So I saw seven men look very similar to Michael Dunn, and that's why I have to confess my bias, because I didn't think that seven white men would convict Michael Dunn of killing a black kid named Jordan Davis. And when that happened, my heart soared. It changed my mind. It changed my life. It let me know that I was on the right track when I said that only 1% of your DNA has to do with the color of your skin and the texture of your hair. That we all are alike, we love alike, we love our family alike, and we care. These certain people that do things and racially motivated cannot outweigh the people that love each other regardless of the color. And that weighed out and that won out in this courtroom. And that's why I say, for the first time in the South, a black kid got justice in a court system where you had seven white men that were on the jury and convicted him of first degree murder. That has never happened in the South before. Mm. That's so powerful and, and deep and sad at, at the same time. Right. And you know, you talk about perception and it's very obvious from watching the film what Michael Dunn's perception of your son and his friends were. Um, some of the phone conversations that were featured in the movie from Michael Dunn from prison speaking with his fiance uh, were very illuminating about his state of mind. He, he said, for example, the, the cops said that these boys did not have criminal records. They must be flying under the radar. Um, he, he also, at the end, refused to take any responsibility for his role in Jordan's murder. He said that this is 100% on Jordan. Right. He said, I don't take any ownership of this. And he said, if I hadn't killed him, he would have killed someone else. Right. Right. And, and the fact that this man perceived your son to be dangerous, to be criminal, even to the point where he saw, or he claims that he saw a weapon that police never found, right. and believed that he was acting in defense of his life when he clearly was not. His life was not in danger from these four teenage boys right. who were going to the mall to go pick up girls later right. on. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so talk to us about what that was like, having to not only overcome the perceptions, or even your, per your perceptions of what the jurors were, right. but how the defense went on to try to m malign who Jordan was and the kind of young man that, that, he, that was your son. Right. Also, uh, I'm going to talk about that. And also, in the film, what you, what you didn't see was that it took three judges. And you, all you saw was Judge Healy. But actually, at the beginning of the trial, the first judge had to recuse herself because the defense attorney didn't like the fact that when me and Jordan's mother entered the courtroom, she welcomed us into her courtroom. Mm. 
and they made an issue of that, and she had to recuse herself. The next judge, the case got so big, she decided to recuse herself. So this was our third judge, okay? Uh, at the beginning of this trial, the judge Healer, Healy brought me and Jordan's mother to the front prior to the trial and said, I, Mr. Davis, I know you um, are going to be very emotional during the trial, but we want to make sure that you and Jordan's mother uh, don't utter a sound in the courtroom. We don't want you to show any emotion. So when you see in that film, uh, you see us looking around and kind of, we, we have to be stoic. He said, because if we see any emotion or if the jury looks at you and feels sorry for you or have any emotion towards you, then we are going to ask for a change of venue. As if it's our fault. And also the people outside with the signs out there and uh, protesting and, and showing uh, justice for Jordan, you, you got to kind of calm that down, go out there and calm that down, because if you don't, again, we're going to change the venue and we may have a mistrial. So in other words, they put all this pressure on you as the family member, because all you're trying to do is sit up there and get justice for your child. But, you know, you get that. And so we listen, and that's why it is the way it is. The Michael Dunns of the world view people of color, black and brown faces, as dangerous. They view us as thugs. They view us basically because what they see on television. And that's why I have a problem with media, because when you see most of your TV shows and movies, if you want to see a black or brown person, just wait for the part when there's a drug dealer. Wait for the part where there's a prostitute. Wait for the part of a homeless person or a person that just committed a crime. Wait for those parts and you'll see people of color in the, in the theater and you'll see it in TV shows. You know, somebody like Denzel Washington that couldn't sniff an Oscar for playing uh, a man that was trying to save his son and John Q couldn't sniff an Oscar because he was trying to be a father, trying to save his son at all costs. But as soon as you play a drug dealing cop, a cocaine sniffing cop, then you get an Academy Award for that. But see, that's what goes on. It's how people want to view you that are people in power or people that are in the media want to view you. You know, even in this in electoral college here, and if you look at the shows on CNN and MSNBC, on CNN, whenever there's a social show talking about uh, riots or something like that, or Flint, Michigan, then you see three or four black people on the show. But when it comes to economics, when it comes to something about the presidency, then you don't see African Americans on the show. You rarely see them on the show. In other words, we're in this box. You know, when it comes to entertainment, yeah, we'll put you on the show. And that's that old shucking and jiving, as we used to say. I'm old school, I'm 63 years old, you know. And, uh, and I remember those days that we always thought when I grew up in Harlem, New York. Anybody here from New York? All right, all right. Grew up in Queens, New York, born in Harlem. And um, I remember the, the days of Adam Clayton Powell and, and when Malcolm came to town and MLK came to town and listened to Huey P. Newton come from the coast and all that and, and all those, you know, Black Panthers trying to have uh, go back to school programs and, and, and the guys out there giving breakfast to kids. I've never seen an organization, you know, but all we hear and see in the movies is that these organizations were so terrible, how they were killing people and, and robbing people and killing cops and all that. You never hear about the Black Panthers feeding hundreds and hundreds of kids before they go to school because their families couldn't feed them. You never heard of their lunch programs, you know. And that's the media. The media is going to shape how you feel about different organizations. The Black Lives Matter organization that we're going to probably get into later. But, you know, they, they're going to shape how you feel about them. When he said Jordan and his boys were under the radar, in other words, at some point, they had to be gangsters or thugs. My son has never been arrested. Not that being arrested is such a big crime, but he hadn't been arrested. My son never did drugs, never did alcohol. Anything like that was a student in school, like everybody else's kid, trying to get out here and chase girls like I did and like some of the guys in here did that are smiling in the audience. 
you know, just a regular kid. And I think that's why a lot of people took to this story is because Jordan was just a regular kid, just like you, not a regular black kid, not a regular white kid, not a regular Asian kid, just a regular kid. Everybody that wanted to be 17 again and think about the things you thought about at 17, about getting your first car, about getting your first apartment, you know, about getting your first career job, you know, those are the kind of things that Jordan was thinking about. And when you see somebody like that get killed, shot dead, and the person that did it has no value for that person's life, did not value Jordan's life. He killed my son, never dialed 911 went home, had a pizza, had a rum and coke, <clears throat> woke up the next morning, saw he had killed a 17-year-old beautiful child, got in his car and ran away two and a half hours to Satellite Beach, Florida. Again, never dialed 911. To this day, never dialed 911. Didn't think enough of that. And so we have a lot of the Michael Dunn's in the world. I call them domestic terrorists. That's what I call them. And we have to rule out and root out domestic terrorists. And I call them that is because when somebody looks on their computer and they decide to join ISIS and they get to the airport, before they go to Turkey and before they go to these countries to join ISIS, the USA arrests them right here at the airport based on what they said in their computer. They don't wait till they commit a crime. Well, how can we have domestic terrorists like the KKK and the Knights of uh, the White Knights, and they say, well, we can't arrest them no matter what they have on their computer. We have to wait for them to commit a crime. We have to wait for them to go to Charleston, South Carolina, and kill nine people in church before we can arrest them. That's bogus, and America knows it's bogus, and they need to do something about it. Ron, you, you talk about Black Lives Matter. And after the conviction of Michael Dunn, that was largely viewed as a victory for the then budding Black Lives Matter movement, which really came out of um, what happened with Trayvon Martin, um, the subsequent acquittal of George Zimmerman. And then Jordan's case happened in such close proximity, not only in time, but in, 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 in distance, in the same state of Florida. So well, what are your thoughts about Black Lives Matter, the movement, um, and, and basically how your son's case helped to catalyze thousands, millions of, of young people across America, across the world, to say the words Black Lives Matter. I'm touched by something that Lucy said in the film. Um, yeah. While you guys were awaiting the verdict, she said how important it was for her to get justice for Jordan because his life mattered. Right. And the Black Lives Matter movement has m mushroomed since then. So what, what are your opinions about the movement now and what do you think the movement is going in the future? A, a few years ago, I was asked by the Justice League New York, Carmen Perez, to come up and hold the banner for Black Lives Matter as we shut down Broadway two years ago on the uh, day of protest. Uh, we walked uh, to Police Plaza down Broadway. We had almost 50,000 people shut down Broadway for five hours in New York. And if you look at the uh, documentary by Henry Louis Gates, you'll see the Black Lives Matter ban banner going across. And if you look at the second part of it, you'll see someone with a black leather coat and a white cap, and that's me holding the banner. The proudest part of that day was that over 60% of the people that were marching down Broadway that were saying Black Lives Matter were white people and their white teenagers. That was a proud day for America. It was a proud day for New Yorkers. Understand that. It wasn't just black people walking down Broadway. Okay? And that's what made it proud for me. Black Lives Matter is a movement, and I've explained that in many occasions, and I have to explain it to people that are supporters of it, that are white, and they, they have T-shirts sometimes that say, stay woke. You might have seen some of those T-shirts. It's because by saying Black Lives Matter, you're not saying white lives don't matter. It's a given. You know, you're not saying that. And, and a lot of white people take it that way. You know, well, yeah, but, you know, what about, you know. But what we're saying in this day and age, because... We have been downtrodden so much, we have been murdered and killed on film, 
and still can get a con conviction that we have to say time and time again, hey, America, hey, world, Black Lives Matter. And it's just a movement. It's not an organization. You don't come and sign up and get a card, you know. And the, the problem with that being a movement like any other movement is that you can't uh, deputize certain people. In other words, there's always going to be people that are going to do wrong and do terrible things and shoot at police for no reason at all and say Black Lives Matter. You know, they're not part of the movement because if you're part of Black Lives Matter movement, you're trying to bring people together. You're not trying to kill people. You're not trying to kill cops. You know, and that's what people have to understand. You can't control something that's not an, in an organizational form. And Black Lives Matter never wanted to be in that form because when you look at Martin Luther King and, and, and the SCLC and some of those other organizations in the 60s, they had the leaders and heads of these organizations. And the problem with those organizations, because all you had to do as someone that I consider a domestic terrorist is go to the leaders of those organizations and if you can pay enough money to turn those leaders, then you've dismantled that organization. So you can't really get a, a true strategy by having a corporate form, by having leaders that can be turned or that can be bought off. You know, we see today that everybody's upset when you get people that go to Trump Tower. They must be bought off, you know, and so, you know, then we, we have this conversation. I know recently we've had a conversation about different visitors to Trump Tower. And so these are when the conversation, but see, Black Lives Matter, there's nobody, you know, you look at Alicia Garza, you look at uh, Patrice Cullors and some of the other founders, and they'll tell you, you know, there's nobody to buy off. You know, the movement is that we want everybody to understand that our lives do matter and that we want to be valued. Not only the black lives, also the LGBTQ community, the queer people. Everybody wants their piece of the pie, which means they want equality and they want freedom to do as they please and not to be corrupted by the system. And the system is always against them. When you have these conversations with the mother of Sandra Bland and some of these other people, those are just bias and racism at its best. And that's what Black Lives Matter mean is just that Every time we see wrongdoing, whether it be Walter Scott in Charleston, South Carolina, where I talked to his mother and father, you have a son that's running away from the police on video, get shot in the back six times in the back, and you know you're wrong as a law enforcement, so much so that you take your taser and you lay your taser next to the body just to make sure that your story is going to play out. And then when the other cop sees you, you pick it up. But the jury, a couple of weeks ago, mistrial, we couldn't decide that the policeman was wrong, even though he shot the man in the back six times running away from him. He must have been something doing something wrong. Maybe he was wrong to run away. See, there's always something that we're doing wrong when we're people of color running away from the police. When you see it time and time again, you know, thank God we have video cameras now. You know, because there's always the policeman's story versus the dead person's story, which has no story. When you see the Laquan McDonald's in Chicago, where you pay off a family $5 million when they don't even file a lawsuit against the city. Now, if I was going to, and I killed somebody's child, and I went over to the family and paid them $5 million, it's called what? Bribery. But when the police do it and when the city does it, it's not bribery. And then we find out when the video comes out that they murdered this kid, shooting him 16 times while he was in a fetal position on the ground. And that's just on and on and on. So that is why they say Black Lives Matter. That's why I support Black Lives Matter. You know, I don't support people that use Black Lives Matter to their own ends and murder cops. I have a lot of policemen that are my friends that murder cops and murder anybody, any citizen, and then say Black Lives Matter. That is not what Black Lives Matter is all about. Jordan's mom, Lucy, was one of seven women that appeared on the campaign trail last year with Hillary Clinton and spoke at the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia as the mothers of the movement. It was Lucy, also the mothers of Trayvon Martin, Sabrina Fulton, um, Mike Brown's mom, Eric Garner's mom, 
Sandra Bland's mom, Hadia Pendleton, and Don Trey Hamilton's mothers. Now, some people criticize, not the mothers, mm -hmm. per se, but the way that they were used and the way that they were framed. Um, because when you have the mothers of the movement, it sort of implies that these people who were killed, um, lost their lives via violence, didn't have any fathers. Right. And I was wondering if you felt as if the fathers of the movement um, we're having their voices erased and having th their faces erased because it, it's a horrible, false stereotype about the fatherless black child. Right. And you were very much in Jordan's <laughs> life. Oh, absolutely. Mike Brown Sr. was very much in right. Mike Brown's life. Right. Tracy Martin was very much in Trayvon Martin's life. Right. So do, do the fathers feel as if they are not heard or acknowledged in the same way that the mothers are. And what are your thoughts about that? They absolutely do. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of instances where you have organizations and also media outlets like CNN and, and some of the other outlets that will bring mothers to certain events and will not pay for the father of that child to come to those events. And that happened to uh, a young man that was killed in New York, Sean Bell, that was killed at the bachelor party. His father called me William Bell. Now, he's married to the mother. They live in the same house. They're, they're a unit. <laughs> and CNN took her to an event, and I asked him why he wasn't at the event. He said, they said they didn't have it in their budget. CNN. You know. <laughs> and so a lot of the shows you'll see the mothers on where the fathers were not invited. It's not that the fathers are not around. They're not invited. Mm. You know, I've been talking about this for a long time that the last four years I've learned so much how the fathers are marginalized when it comes to these events. You know, the first thing they want to show if there's a tragedy is that the mothers, because mothers are more emotional, especially on camera when it just happens. You know, the fathers are kind of don't want to show as much emotion. Most fathers, we cry alone. We cry in the house, you know, we might be looking at sports, and I know for me, I used to look at sports with Jordan. Uh, we used to look at the New York Giants together, you know, we, we'll look at them sorry Knicks or something, <laughs> you know. And, and we'll sit and go the back and forth on the couch, and of course I got the big chair, the easy chair, you know how we do. And uh, right now, you know, when these playoffs are around, I look at where Jordan used to sit, and I break down and I cry. And see, CNN, MSNB, none of these outlets see us men when we have to sit there and cry by ourselves because we prefer to cry by ourselves, most men. Most men don't even want their wives to see them cry because you've got to be strong. You've got to be the head of the household, you know. And it tears us up because we're, we grew up, most men, especially black men, mothers and fathers, they tell you when you grow up, you would be the man of the house, right? Anything happens, you be the man of the house. You take care of it. When your children, if anything happens with your children, you're supposed to go out and take care of it. You're supposed to protect your family. And when something like this happens, this tragedy happens, and you couldn't, I couldn't protect Jordan. I was at work, I couldn't protect Jordan. It pains you. It pains you that you wasn't there. And they, they, they're taking black families apart because they have mass incarceration in this nation. You got 2.2 million people incarcerated in private prisons even in this nation. The private prisons are on the stock exchange. CCA, the Corrections Corporation of America, one of the hottest trading stocks on the stock exchange, trading on the lives of people most states that use private prisons, they guarantee 90% occupancy in the prisons. The state is, in other words, we're going to put people in prison. If we got to pay for these beds, you better believe we're going to use these beds. The United States is only 5% of the population of the world. We incarcerate 25%, a quarter of the entire world, right here in the United States. That's, and 67% are people of color, when we only make up about 12 or 13% of the nation. That's where the fathers are. If they're not in prison, they're in the control of the prison system. 
if they're not doing that, they're making laws. So if you don't have a good job and you pay child support, if you're away from your wife or your girlfriend and you can't pay child support, that's something where we're going to put you in jail. Not that we're going to find you a job, which makes sense, and make you work so the young lady can get money for the children, which makes sense. We will arrest you and put you in jail. So now you can't pay child support. Then on top of that, which breaks up the family unit, then on top of that, most of the time when you come out of prison after doing five or six years, do you know you still owe five or six years of child support? How can you pay child support when you've been in prison? And they're paying you pennies on a dollar and selling the same things you're making at Walmart and all these Kmarts and everywhere else. It used to be license plates. We used to laugh about that. But they're making the furniture you sit on today. And all these corporations, it's just 21st century slavery. That's what it is. 21st century <laughs> slavery. And that's why all these people are making money off the sweat and tears and backs of these families. And we better wake up to that because it's going to get worse. The petty things that we used to do and silly things as teenagers that we used to do. How many of us was 15, 16, 17, 18, was in a car with somebody drinking beer in an open can driving a car? We all did. We all had somebody in the car drinking or doing something. Well, now you get arrested, everybody in the car gets arrested. Because we have to arrest as many people in this country as we can. And then we're going to marginalize the fathers because of the way that we feel about the fathers. The fathers have no voice in America. The black fathers, in particular, have no voice in America. You're viewed as dangerous. I dare you to put a hoodie on and walk down the street because we already think you're dangerous. If you wear a suit and tie, you might be all right, but if you wear a hoodie or you got gold teeth or your pants are sagging, you got a target on your back. And that's real America. That's real talk. I tell people when I come, I say, you know what? You're getting an unfiltered Ron Davis. I said, because I'll take the questions from you that's real, and I give you real answers. I've been in this world 63 years, and I'm telling you, I've seen it. And I've been all over the world to 30-something countries. And the black men and men of color are being marginalized. They have the women's movement, and it's a great movement. But the women can be stronger if they get the men to be with the women, and then we are all stronger together. We're going to open up the floor in just a, a few moments for questions. So if you have any questions, be thinking of it. And we're going to send a mic around uh, so you can ask Ron some questions. But while we're on the subject of the law, Ron, I wanted to talk about stand your ground, because that is what Michael Dunn asserted in his defense uh, as, as to his reasons for killing Jordan. And this law passed in Florida, signed into law by then Governor Jeb Bush in 2005. And uh, there's some recent research out. The Journal of the American Medical Association appears to show that homicides in Florida jumped significantly very shortly after this law went on the books. I mean, significantly to the point of uh, a rise of 24% a sudden and sustained 24% jump in the monthly homicide rate. The rate of homicides by firearms in Florida rose by 32%. And you told me that you've been living in Florida since 2002. So you know what Florida was before and what it was after. And, and we actually have an attorney here with us. Um, Mr. Gordon is here with us. We're going to ask his, uh, get his expertise about how stand your ground is a thing in Florida and not so much in Maryland. But what has changed in Florida? How has the landscape been affected since the implementation of this law? Okay. Uh, the law was given and written in the state of Florida. Marion Hammer, who was the first female NRA president. And if you look at the signing of the law by then Governor Jeb Bush, if you look over his right shoulder, you'll see her standing there. The NRA is a very powerful organization. And they're using this law to put like a flag around the gun owners. In other words, we can sell millions of more guns if we had laws to protect our gun owners. And so stand your ground goes by, what was the thought of the perpetrator? 
if Michael Dunn shoots Jordan Davis, we don't care about the action. We want to know, did he fear for his life? Even though Michael Dunn was the only one with a gun, even though Michael Dunn was the aggressor, did he fear for his life? So how can you have it both ways? You're the aggressor, you have the gun, like George Zimmerman, but all of a sudden you feared for your life. And so it's one of those, it doesn't really make sense because all it does is perpetrate a lie because every time that somebody shoots and kills somebody, especially when they're not near their person, like in the Mike Brown case, where the officer said he feared for his life, this kid was coming at me, but he was 35, 40 feet away. You also shot the kid in the top of his head. He was six foot four, and you were six feet even, but somehow the bullet went from the top of his head down, which means he was on his knees. But you feared for your life. And when you go to a concealed weapons class in Florida, because my attorney did, they teach you in the class to say, if you ever are involved in a shooting, say these five words, I feared for my life. That's what they teach you to say, and that's why you hear it so much. Even the police say the same thing, I feared for my life, because they tell you to say that, because then they want to go over to the Stand Your Ground statue and try to figure out not what happened, but did you think that somebody had a knife? Did you think this young man was pulling something out of his pants? See, all these cases, well, Tamir Rice, who was 12 years old, he reached for his wristband, you know. So in my mind, I feared for my life. Even though I approached him and within two seconds I shot and killed him, I feared for my life. See, that's what perpetrates all of this is the fear for my life, and that's what I call staying your ground, the fear for my life, is because the juries, they hear that, and, and the jury instruction is doing stand your ground. And also, in, and as the lawyer's going to tell you, in self-defense cases, the same thing. They tell you that there's a stand your ground issue in the self-defense cases also, where if you feared for your life and you had reasonable fear, then you have no duty to retreat. Even though you have a gun, you have no duty to retreat. And one of the big things, I spoke in front of the uh, Florida uh, House of Representatives and they didn't really want me to speak before them, so they rushed in and they got Marion Hammer, who is the, was one of the architects of Stand Your Ground. They brought her in to make sure that they didn't overturn Stand Your Ground. And one of the things that I was focusing on is this. In Stand Your Ground, if any one of you go like to a movie theater and you got your two kids with you and you had a great time at the movie theater, you come out of the theater and two people are arguing and they both have guns and they're standing their ground. Do you realize under the stand your ground statue if they pull a gun and shoot and miss and hit one of your kids or you and kill you that you cannot take them to court, either a civil court or a criminal court because you're considered collateral damage. Under the stand your ground statue as long as that person said, I feared for my life, and they get to stand your ground, anybody that gets shot, I don't care if 10 people get shot, it was not considered a crime because they approved stand your ground, and anybody got hurt or killed is considered collateral damage. That's the laws in over 30 states in this country. Mm. Jay Wendell Gordon, are you still here? All right. <laughs> uh, so, so what's the difference? Can we get him a mic if you don't have one already? Like, so in, in the state of Maryland, you have a lawful duty to retreat. Do I understand that correctly? Except if you're in your home as it relates to the castle doctrine. You all are pretty accurate as to what the law actually is. In Maryland, obviously we don't have stand your ground, but we do have self-defense. Um, we do have what's called the castle doctrine, which is ba basically the... Uh, the, uh, the parent of stand your ground, more or less. Uh, the Castle Doctrine basically states that there's no, de no duty to retreat in your home. Your home is your castle, and that's really where it comes from. Stand your grounds takes those rights that you have within the castle and it allows them outside of the home. So when you're, place when you're someplace where you have the right to be, uh, the, work the law works exactly as Mr. Davis has indicated. But um, in Maryland, there is a duty to retreat for instance, if you know that 
you're walking down the street and you know that you're going to be involved in a confrontation with somebody who's down there, you have a duty to cross the street so you don't confront them. But if you feel as though your life is in danger uh, or you're in fear of serious bodily injury, and indeed the person doesn't even have to put their hands on you, they can faint, you know, feign uh, some type of assault against you. They come into your personal if they come into your personal space, uh, you can exercise your right to self-defense. So self-defense is alive and well. Uh, we use it all the time. <laughs> Every time the issue presents itself, and even when it doesn't, we, if we can create an issue out of the facts, uh, we will present that as a defense. But uh, I'm glad we don't have stand your ground here in Maryland. And, it, and I don't think it'll ever pass. And, you know, we, sh we showed a racial, a racial in Florida, a racial bias to stand your ground because of the fact that when they brought up the cases, the percentages of the time that a black person that shoots a white person gets standing your ground versus the opposite. And they show that it was a great racial bias to stand your ground. See, the, the thing is, if I say to you that this white person feared this black person sitting in the front row, in most people's mind, especially a, a jury, if this man right here, this gentleman right here, says that he feared this black man, for the most part, they're going to agree with him. They say, "Yeah, you, yeah, I'm looking at, yeah, you probably did feel fear him." But see, if he says that he feel, feared him, he will not get stand your ground. He will just not get it. And he could be a bad guy. He could be a tough guy. Doesn't matter. He could have invaded your personal space. But you're not going to get stand your ground. And so that's why we're trying to repeal stand your ground. But see, they're very smart about stand your ground. Just like you said, the castle doctrine, your home is your castle. In the state of Florida, they've attached it to the castle doctrine. For you to repeal stand your ground, you have to repeal the castle doctrine, and nobody's going to do that. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to amend stand your ground. That's what we're trying to do, because we know we're not, we're not going to be able to appeal it, repeal it. You raised the issue early on when you were just uh, presenting your position about the media. Um, and the media is what caused Michael Dunn and other people of like minds to have that imagery of thug or, or gangster or less than humans. Right. Uh, and I'm wondering is if the the place where we need to try to affect some change is how the media is constantly portraying us, portraying our children, portraying our threat, you know. And if that's the case, because, uh, you know, being in media myself, I understand that uh, 85 or 86 percent of the media is actually owned by six corporations. Should we be trying to target one of those corporations uh, to, to change how they constantly present us? I mean, should we, I mean, is that the area that we can maybe fix some of this? That makes a lot of sense. The, the problem that we're having and we, we will continue to have is that as a people, black people, brown people, Latinos, we look at people that are celebrities as leaders. Many celebrities are out to get their money. Mm -hmm. And these same corporations, like you said, the six heads of these corporations, they're the ones that's paying that paycheck. And because you don't have these leaders, so-called leaders, to come out and lead the charge to boycotts or whatever you want to do, you know, but you always have these other people that are worried about those paychecks coming in, and so they don't want to lead. We as a people have to stop looking at celebrities as leaders. We have to look at people in the trenches like you as leaders, you know, people that are not going to play by their rules that, you know, you get $700,000 and we'll give you a show and then you become a leader, you know. I've worked with Al Sharpton and the rest of them, you know, and they get their money and they get their shows. He's done some good stuff. See, I'm not saying people like Jesse and them haven't done good things. They have. You know, they've marched and they've protested and they've done good things. But I think it's time for the younger people to come out and lead. You know, I think us as older people, older statesmen, we should support the younger people. I want to see somebody 30, 31, 32 leading. You know, that, that, that 
you know, don't have all that dirt from being paid off. You know, that paid off dirt. Because it's hard to stop getting paid off once you start getting paid off. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean, people? Hard to stop getting paid off. So there's some young people out here that are leaders, and I want to keep seeing them lead, men and women leaders out here, you know, because these other people, they're so used to getting paid off, they're not going to stop. And, and like I said, these media outlets are the ones that we should be boycotting, making them come to bear, come to the knees, you know. They don't really care about what you think until they have to care about what you think, you know. And I think in America that uh, we are, are trying to use the, the old notion that the Bible tells us that be patient like Job, and the Bible tells us to turn the other cheek and, and all this stuff. I'm, I'm going, like she said, I'm going to uh, India in about two days and 10 days of meditation and teaching me nonviolent methods and all that good stuff. And that's okay, good for my soul. But I want the young people to use any method possible to achieve what they should have achieved years ago. I don't care what method it is, use it. All right. Ron, this might be a good opportunity for you to share with Baltimore about the Jordan Davis Foundation, the foundation that you founded in Jordan's memory. So t talk to us about that. Yeah, if you go on uh, walkwithjordan.org, walkwithjordan.org, that's our organization. And we give scholarships every year to seniors going to college. We try to give them money to get books and things like that that they need to go to college. So we do that every year for the last three years. Uh, we also set up uh, trips like we, we're going to go to come to Washington probably in May of this year. I'm trying to get 10 students and we pay for half of the students and their parents will pay the other half and we'll bring them. What we're trying to do is get them out of their neighborhood. You have some students that are very brilliant, but they live in terrible uh, situations like the young lady was saying and they and all you know if you're a child and all you see is drug dealers and prostitutes in the corner and you, you know in your mind there's nothing else to life you know so what we're trying to do is bring them out of their neighborhoods we're going to bring them to Washington we're going to take them to the African American Museum and some other places then I want to take them uh, to meet uh, Congressman John Lewis who's a good friend of mine I, I'd like them to meet him and he can talk to them and they will, will talk with under speak with understanding and talk with them about how far they've come. You know, a lot of times, you know, when you see the ills of, of the nation right now, and you're a young person, you don't think anybody came far at all. You know, you, you look and you say, well, you know, you guys didn't do anything. But if you look back in the 50s and 60s, what was going on in those times, you will see there's a great difference between what happened in the 50s and 60s and what's going on now. You know, I tell people that in the South, in Birmingham and Montgomery, Black people used to get on the front of the bus, pay their fare, and have to get back off the bus and go to the back door to get on the bus. And oftentimes, the bus would leave them when they were walking to the back door. So in other words, you paid your fare, got off the bus to go to the back door, and the bus would pull off. Happened over and over again in the South. So there's a lot of things that happened that they've overcome. And they didn't overcome it with just turn the other cheek. There were some battles out there, and there's some frontline battles. Jordan's mother, she has a bigger heart than me. She has a bigger religious heart. She has a forgiveness heart, and she's always trying to be peaceful. But I tell you what, born and bred in Harlem, grew up in New York, I have my moments. <laughs> I have my moments, and sometimes it takes that sword to get things across. Oh, and so uh, we, you know, there's different methods of doing this, but one thing I want you to realize that each and every one of us have some kind of bias in us. We all do. It's nothing negative. We all look at certain situations and certain people, and we have a dislike or a little bit dislike coming across us. Sometimes you're on a plane and somebody sits next to you. How come sometimes you can have a great conversation with somebody, and sometimes you can sit on a plane and don't even say a word to the other person? It's just something that's in us where you just feel like that person is not your type of person. And that's OK. But we have to get the violence out of that the Michael Dunn violence out of that, the George Zimmerman violence out of that. And that's what we have to ask ourselves every day. Can you get that violence out of that, whether you have to meditate or what you have to do? But you can't look at somebody and want to hurt and harm them and kill them and take them away from their family. This is America. How much does mental health issues 
play out in these situations that are racial, clearly, mm -hmm. but are mental health issues. So my question is a mental health issue. How real was mental health in the case with your son? It, it was real because, you know, number one, the FDA used to have a 10-year testing on drugs that came into the market. Now they don't test anything. You can put anything on the market, it'll just say has not been evaluated by the FDA. So you have any drug you want on the market with minimum testing. And how many side effects do they have? 15 or so? Whenever you get something on the market, right? Every commercial, you wait for the side effects. Well, these people are taking these drugs, you know? So the people that you think have a gun, remember, there are more guns in the U.S. than population. Now you add people with drugs that cause a psychosis. And you see all the things that they're doing. Look at the, the nightclub in Orlando, Florida. I went down there and did a session down there after the Pulse nightclub. Who in their right mind would go to a club and just shoot up random people in a club? See, and you see more and more of this because what? The denominator is you have guns, guns, and guns, and more guns in the hands of people that they shouldn't be in. And this other man had a gun uh, from the West Coast that came recently and shot up the place. He had a gun. The FBI knew he had a gun and gave him his gun back. You know, so you're right. It's a mental health issue, and uh, we don't have facilities for all the people that need them. You know, we really don't. And so you have to be very, very careful. Even when you go out here tonight, I'm, I'm praying for all of you and to be careful. Uh, I know they're going to cut it off, and, and that's fine. And I thank you for allowing me to say this, and I just want to say that you made a decision to come out tonight. You didn't have to make a decision to do that. You came out to see this film and to see our family, and I appreciate it. I have love in my heart for each and every one of you, and I really appreciate you coming out. And you're an activist for the mere fact that you took the time to come out tonight and showed your activism. Thank you very much for coming out. Ron Davis, ladies and gentlemen. And we want to thank you on behalf of the Real News Network, on behalf of the Raising Voices Film Festival for all coming out. We would like to thank the Maryland Film Festival for their support, the Bertha Foundation, as well as Stand Up Baltimore. We are going to be doing this every month, every third Thursday. You can expect a free screening of a documentary that focuses on social issues, environmental issues, workers' rights. We're going to run the gamut. So we'd like to see you, all of you come back uh, next month, third Thursday, for the Raising Voices Film Festival. Thank you all so much for coming out. And give it up for Ron Davis one more time. Thank you.